We face into an Ireland of great promise, an Ireland at peace with itself for the first time in more than a thousand years. Well, I think it was tremendously exciting. We were a lucky generation in some respects. You know, I was prepared and did to, to, to dedicate every hour of, of the God-given day uh, to make it work. Fianna Fáil will bridge the dream of centuries and create an Ireland of peaceful prosperity. After a turbulent first year as Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern was about to embark on a decade in power that would see Ireland transformed. And you will be there to see it forever. Meal among it. These would be the Bertie years, where the man at the top would reach new highs and new lows. Where you going? You're not coming back from He is associated with the boom times. The end of his tenure was the bust time. Bertie Ahern helped to make the future. Are you nervous? Are you nervous? Why did you do it like this? Nervous? I never detected the big brown spell against Bertie, or for Bertie. His strength is with the Irish people. But in the end, he couldn't escape the past. Well, it's stupid. Would you give a warm, warm welcome to the EU Commissioner for Employment and Social Affairs, Padraig Flynn. Here he is, big fella. My memories are of sitting down to watch The Late Late that night and then of just seeing a series of horrific implosions. I get give or take about a net 100,000. And out of that 100,000, I run a home in Dublin, Castle Bar, and Brussels. I want to tell you something. I'll try it sometime. Horik Flynn's appearance on The Late Late at the start of 1999 was a personal disaster. What are you going to do about the Flood Tribunal and the 50 grand, Gilmore? Well, I want to tell you about that. I've said on my piece about that. It would also, in time, prove catastrophic for Bertie Ahern. But you know Gil Martin. Oh, yeah. You know Tom Gil Martin. Yes. Yeah. I haven't seen him now for some years. Tom Gil Martin was an English based developer who had blazed into Dublin in the late 1980s with ambitious plans to develop shopping centres. All as I knew about him at the time, I was a big developer from England. I mean, I, I'd be honest from my position. I'm sorry I heard about him then or since. But that's my position. He was looking at developing a large shopping centre out where Quarry Vale now is, Liffey Valley. And indeed had assembled a very important strategically located site before um, the, the big players in Dublin business realised. And that's where his, his problems in a way began. Gil Martin spent millions developing a site at Quarry Vale, which opened as the Liffey Valley Centre in late 98. By then, he had lost control of the project to his business partner, Owen O'Callaghan. Now, stories began to appear about Tom Gilmartin's time in Ireland. Well, Tom Gilmartin's allegation is that when he was trying to develop his Quarry Vale project, he discovered people wanted money. The details were, were sparse. There was the allegation that he'd given £50,000 to Porrick Flynn. He's not well. That pro really provoked and annoyed Tom Gilmartin. His wife isn't well. Yeah, that really got him fired up. He's out of sorts. They responded to uh, <clears throat> what Mr Flynn had to say on television. Tom Gilmartin then decided he would come to Dublin and he would give evidence. Now, another major key witness had come forward to the tribunal with, with quite startling allegations in relation to political corruption. You're not actually saying that you didn't get this money? Uh, I, I think if, if people take contributions of, of 30, 40, uh, 50,000, uh, it's very hard uh, to explain uh, and, and for that reason, I, I do not think people should do that. For now, Tom Gilmartin's allegations were focused on Porrick Flynn, but he had already been in contact with the tribunal about the Taoiseach. Mr Gilmartin is quoted as saying that even if Bertie Hearn survives this week, he won't survive what I have coming down the line for him. There were lots and lots of difficulties with that government that a lot of them got sorted out because of... Uh, the relationship between myself and Mary Harney. What was Sheedy was? What was Sheedy about? Yeah, Sheedy was a, a, a very difficult uh, issue and, and caused a, a lot of uh, problems. Philip Sheedy was a young architect who had been convicted of killing a mother of two while driving drunk. He had also worked with a close associate of Bertie Ahern, Joe Burke. In April 1999, it emerged that Philip Sheedy had been released from prison early in unusual circumstances. 
two judges and a court official resigned in the aftermath. And then Bertie Ahern broke some news to his Tawnishta. Bertie Ahern came to me and told me that he had made representations to the Department of Justice for the early release of Philip Sheedy. I asked him to put it on the record of the doll. It was important that he should choose to do that, and he agreed to do that. But before facing the doll, the Taoiseach spoke to the newspapers. And I was absolutely um, furious about that. But given that Mary Harney asked you on two occasions... No, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't think Mary Harney did that, you see, and I, I'm not going to get into that. And I'm, furthermore, I'm he said that he didn't agree to do that. Eileen, as I was certain that Taoiseach was going to put on the doll record, there was no doubt about it. I did really think that day that the, the government was about to come to an end. The Tisha says that uh, the government are going to run for another three years. Do you see it like that at this stage? <laughs> I don't know about that. The, the, these, I mean, these kind of issues that blow up, that attract big media attention, where people can see an injustice. Uh, and you can understand that. The cabinet meeting was being held uh, the next day. I didn't go to the meeting at the start. And Charlie McGreevy ended up as the uh, mediator between both of us. I did not get a good opening to mention the matter in the doll, as I had hoped at question time last week. But equally, I accept that I was remiss in not finding some way of doing so. It took Mary a little while to get used to the Bertie style, which I can readily understand. Let's put it like that. There was an element of a triumvirate in it. There were three consuls, and clearly Bertie was the first consul. But Charlie McCreevy was a man with a very strong mind of his own. How much freedom did you give Charlie McCreevy? Uh, a lot. Well, Bertie knew what he was getting when he made him Minister of Finance. I'm heavily influenced by, say, having competition, free markets. I was looking up for government with the Progressive Democrats, and uh, I knew the Progressive Democrats were there to back me up. He once said to me, if I was in a government, a majority Fianna Fáil government, I couldn't have slashed the taxes as quickly as I did. Charlie was in at 7 in the morning. Charlie was there late. I trusted that he would get on and make decisions. I would argue with him on some things. He wouldn't be the missing socialist we've been looking for for years, but um, he, he, ha he had a good social conscience. And remember all the huge increases um, for social welfare um, were, were given by Charlie. Straight out of the traps in 1997, they started reforming the tax system. They started lowering tax. And it was a government that, you know, you had a sense, had a set of targets that it wanted to achieve. You take, for example, the Asia strategy, very far-seeing. Um, now we're all talking about China and India. Ten years ago, in 99, he set up the idea of an Asia strategy. Uh, and we had our trade missions to India and China. I think addressing the issues of poverty, huge strides were made. I think addressing the issues of the elderly, massive strides were made. He became Taoiseach in 1997. Within three years, the Irish economy had grown by a third in the space of three years, and it was a phenomenal performance. While Ireland boomed, the planning tribunal was excavating the recent past. In April 2000, it appeared to make a breakthrough. Frank Dunlop, a prominent lobbyist, revealed details of his activities in the early 90s. Frank Dunlop was the front man for Mr O'Callaghan in the rezoning of Quarry Vale for what is now the Liffey Valley Shopping Centre. Dunlop says he set up a war chest which he used to, to pay bribes in cash to a whole range of politicians. But he says he never told uh, Owen O'Callaghan what he was up to. It was Spy Wednesday, appropriately named, when Frank Dunlop uh, came into the tribunal. He agreed to write names on a piece of paper, the names of politicians to whom he had made payments. Bertie Ahern was not one of those identified by Frank Dunlop, but that same week his name did surface in a separate allegation which would prove to be false. Oh, no. In Easter Sunday, I think it was, 2000, um, Frank Connolly wrote a huge article on several pages uh, that I had taken 50,000 bribe uh, at the All-Ireland Final of 1989. This was from Starry O'Brien? This is from Starry O'Brien. Starry O'Brien, as he was known, he said that he paid Bertie O'Hearn a cheque for £50,000 in the car park of the Burlington Hotel on behalf of the Cork developer Ono Callan. So, I mean, I, I went out the following day, I was in Arbor Hill, and I rejected it. 
Uh, I never received one penny from Mona Callan, uh, for myself, for the party or for anyone else. It very quickly became clear to everybody that this guy was not a credible person to be making an allegation like this. I'm standing in all the rain, that's what I'm doing now. My legal people told me that wasn't good enough, I'd have to go to the courts and fight it. We apologised to, to Mr O'Callaghan and to Bertie O'Hearn and retracted the story. The judge said that Mr O'Hearn was absolutely cleared and uh, awarded the maximum damages. Bertie O'Hearn had faced down the allegation and proven his innocence in this case. I choose to sue so that the Irish public could see that this allegation was false and malicious. But in the years to come, a similar allegation would surface at the tribunal. Were you worried on, on taking office that people might not accept Celia's role? No, I wasn't. I mean, I mean C C Celia was my partner. She worked very hard. Uh, and when we were abroad, she worked very hard. She took her role seriously and, and, and worked very hard of it. And I was appreciative of, obviously, when you're travelling the world uh, and somebody is with you. Uh, and that was a big help to me, and, and I appreciated it. They seemed very close and very much a team uh, in terms of his political life and she herself is a very competent political operator. Ms Larkin, who left the Taoiseach's side immediately after arriving, entered the reception without the Taoiseach. We did get into a few tiffles and, um, and a few functions. In May 2001, the Taoiseach hosted a reception for Cardinal Connell. Celia Larkin's role as official partner was called into question. In fairness, it, it was not of his making. Other people did send me some tough letters, but I definitely got a prize collection of letters from, from other senior people. What do you mean? Senior church people. I think the, the key thing about Bertie, for, for the good things and the bad things about him, or the perception of him, people see a lot of themselves or their own family. I mean, no other uh, leading Irish politician had, had been there, and that's an experience common to a lot of Irish families. Through the Bertie years, traditional deference to authority was on the wane, for the church and also for Ireland's political masters. We've done well. We've done very well. We've done extraordinarily well. Now time to stand up and pay a bit back. I can remember the Nice Treaty, the first Nice Treaty, very well. I wasn't very long working in government buildings at the time. Uh, it was taken for granted that there would be a yes vote. There are consequences very serious economic and political consequences, in my view, by a, a vote which would be inimical to our national interest. I mean, I think people were, to some extent, sleepwalking. Within one hour of the ballot boxes being opened here at the RDS this morning, it was clear from the tallies that Dublin was saying no to Nice. All the media, without exception, all the political parties, with the exception of the Greens, all of the trade unions, all the employers' organisation, the farmers' organisation, all said, we have to vote yes. Very good. And the Irish people said, yeah, that's very good advice, and said no. I, I, I think it's remarkably healthy development. But as I've said, there is no obvious or simple solution at this time. The most glaring failure was his personal failure to sell the Nice Treaty to the electorate. Popularity is not much good, Taoiseach, unless you do something constructive with it minutes into my warning and all I've I have got so far is just saying shelter get off the bike get into shelter yes Marian, uh, Marian. Do, don't drink the water yes yes take take your iodine tablet yeah how did I get my yes. iodine tablet uh, that will be that will be uh, in in the fact sheet when it gets to your, <laughs> your home okay oh poor Joe I did actually hear that interview and I think every politician in the Dáil had great sympathy for him. No, but you Marianne, tell me, no, you no, have no, the facts in front of you. How I, do I get my iodine tablet? I, I, we mustn't be alarmistic. Because at the end of the interview, the whole country felt unsafe. <laughs> the government is on full alert. We have the, the finest public administration in Europe. In late 2001, the government rehearsed plans to cope with a theoretical meltdown at Sellafield. But across the Atlantic, a real threat had emerged. 9-11 was a huge rebuff um, and it sent shockwaves particularly through all the foreign direct investment companies. I think we went from an annualised growth rate about 8.8% to 0.1% in the last quarter of 2001. Though the economy stalled, the government kept public spending flowing ahead of the election due by mid-2002. 
Finance Minister Charlie McCreevy stunned the European Commission with a spending spree of unprecedented proportions and the biggest tax cuts in the history of the state. In a way, it fed an awful lot of expectation. Take your marks. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we could do nothing wrong in that election, really. It started off with showtime at the Shelburne, and it went up from there. There's an awful lot of work put in by a lot of people. Maybe that's the reason why I'm born again. And he had himself, I recall, quite a superstition about the need to have elections when the weather was good. How are you doing, guys? Oh, oh, yeah. Great to see you. The old, the old a lot on more to do. It's one of the great election slogans ever, and uh, it worked. I can confirm that there are no significant overruns projected and no cutbacks whatsoever are being planned, secretly or otherwise. He had prodigious physical energy in terms of the amount of territory he would cover against a flatness and emptiness on, on, on the Fine Gael side. Competition wasn't, you know, it was like winning a soccer match 5-0. The notion of an overall majority started to emerge in our heads. It was like the goal that dare not speak its name. You don't want something achieved by stealth. You don't want Fianna Fáil coming in under the public's radar screen and achieving an overall majority. The kind of hoodoo about the notion that Fianna Fáil gets an overall majority, they'll, you know, it'll rampage around the country like King Kong or something. <laughs> <laughs> the last 72 hours of the campaign. I very vividly remember one headline, I think it was, it's all over, bar the voting. Bertie Ahern is certain to be Taoiseach, certain to have 80. It's a stunning result for Fianna Fáil. We should have comfortably got an overall majority and just a little bit of vote management. Uh, the people gave us the overall majority. Um, we, as a political party, um, we gave it back. Election 2002 was still a stunning victory for Bertie Ahern. We won it. Great! He had come within a few seats of winning an overall majority, a feat that was last achieved in the 70s. But to stay in power, Ahern needed to strike a new deal with the PDs, and their price was the Bertie Bowl. There was an awful tension around the stadium. Clearly, it was something Bertie Ahern really wanted. He's hugely interested in sport. I mean, the costings were, oh, skyrocket. They were, at one point, a billion. I think he himself realised uh, that trying to sell the concept of a stadium uh, was a step too far at that juncture. He's the consummate pragmatist. He knew that if that was, you know, the price of, of doing a deal with the Progressive Democrats in government, he would walk away from it. That's probably one of the hardest things I did. I've made mistakes in my life. It was a mistake not to have a national stadium. And it's the historic challenge of the government that takes office today to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is not a false dawn and that our economic development does not prove to be fool's goal. After the victory came the hangover. The post-9-11 slump had blown a hole in the public finances. Charlie McCreevy now moved to plug it. Charlie McCreevy said, we're going the wrong road, boys and girls, and we've got to get on the right road again. I cut back expenditure for you dramatically. Why did I do that? Well, the situation had changed. We cannot keep going on increasing willy-nilly the vote going to help at the expense of all other departments. My political view is you get one chance to go in with the knife. Thanks, lads. Thank lads, is there any way I can cut your salaries a bit? Any... No cutbacks whatsoever are being planned. The perception took hold that we'd actually fooled the people and conned our way into power. And there was a huge backlash against that. McCreevy and myself in particular had to take the brunt of making the correct decisions, decisive decisions, that would ultimately pull the country around quickly. Community employment schemes throughout the country, they began to be cut back. In my own constituency, three to four schools which we had promised in the election would be built were actually cancelled. There was a very large backlash. Our own party were aggravated at us, at us the electorate was aggravated at us. The budgets were being pared back fairly dramatically. We did actually, we did the right thing for the economy. <laughs> there was some good news for the government. The Nice Treaty passed second time round. 
But still, the problems kept piling up. There's no adage in politics that if one thing goes wrong, well, then five, six, seven, eight things go wrong. We are being ejected from office because the government has uh, failed to honour its obligation. This agreement is over. It is difficult. Uh, there are problems. There's no good to anyone denying that. There are a lot of tensions. Our poll rating again was going through the floor, and there seemed to be an unending series of scandals of one kind and the other and accidents. Deputy G.V. Wright was found to have an alcohol level above the legal limit. We are experiencing extreme turbulence and there was a sense that the government was out of touch. January 2003, the last section of the Millennium Spire is finally put in place, years late and way over budget. It's, it's, it doesn't serve any purpose, does it? Except maybe Bertie would like to sit on the top of it. The Spire was loose change amongst the billion spent every year by the government, yet well into Bertie Ahern's second term, Ireland's infrastructure strained to keep up with the boom. People were beginning to ask questions and say, sometimes it feels as if we're living in an economy rather than in a society. If we have all of this money, why do we still have all of these prefabs in schools and we don't have a school building project that, that should be where it is? There were various examples of where there seems to be an extreme laziness in the spending of public money. That's how we ended up with things like the PPAR system being an absolute disaster and the health service costing hundreds of millions. Things like the electronic voting machines also being a waste of money. But in particular in relation to things like roads, we had overspends. We had to develop the mechanisms of uh, being able to spend on big capital programmes. Up until that, it was always piecemeal, a bit this year, a bit next year. It was a bad year, nothing the year after. So we hadn't got the system. It took us a while to learn from our mistakes, but I think we have. There appeared to be so much money swashing around in the system that they took the brakes off in controlling public expenditure. Current day-to-day -day public expenditure was going through the roof. House prices were going through the roof. It was becoming evident that the guard, the nurse, the civil servant were finding that buying a house was a goal that was, that was getting outside of the grasp. We had the benchmarking report, which granted average 9% pay increases across the board in the public sector. And it was a case of saying, well, look, rather than deal with the house price spiral, let's ensure that the average guard married to the nurse uh, gets paid more money in order to do it. It was an expensive solution which sidestepped a problem. We had the crazy decentralization system, which seemed to be designed to keep people around the country happy. The imperative always seemed to be, get the deal on the day and the future can look after itself. I wanted to decrease the national debt dramatically. I wanted to write down the national debt. So that was my first priority. My second one was, and we share this with Charlie, that wealth creators was a good thing in the country. What we wanted to do then is share the wealth. By the second period in government, the focus was on driving economic growth. It's estimated every time a house changes hands, €87,000 goes to the taxman. The property boom fueled growth and provided the government with huge resources. But soaring prices could not be sustained forever. The higher house prices went, that was a symbol of economic achievement rather than something that was storing up a potential future storm. I think it was an error to relax policy when they did, and a consequence of that is, is the pain that we're suffering now. I mean, in the presidency in 2004, I, I mean, I travelled the world in, in six months. My job was to get 27 governments on side. For six months in 2004, Bertie Ahern was effectively President of Europe. It was Ireland's turn to take the chair at EU meetings, and the Taoiseach set himself the ambitious task of securing a deal on a new constitution for Europe. He knew the stakes were very high. He knew that for a small country like ours, if we could pull it off, there would be great kudos. There was no expectation. Uh, across Europe that Ireland could bring it together. But it was an all-consuming mission uh, for those six months. During the presidency, in all the hours we spent on the government jet crisscrossing the capitals of Europe, he never once took his head out of the brief. He is one of the most focused um, and disciplined people I have ever come across. 
Another day, and it seems another late night at the European office for Bertie Ahern. Yeah, well, for the two days, I mean, we spent two days uh, tied down, and uh, there were about half a dozen issues, as there always is. So what I did was I tried to, you know, click off one by one. I, I called in all of the main players, Gerhard Schroeder, Jacques Chirac, uh, and we, we, we trashed it out, and, and as it went into the night, it was coming clear we, we could actually crack it. Now, they were watching my style, they knew me fairly well, but watching my style, they believed that we could do it. Piece by piece, it's slowly getting there. He's a very, very sharp, very intelligent guy, and when he was negotiating, getting the countries to sign up to the Constitutional Treaty um, for Europe, which he really did, um, I mean, that could not have been done without a lot of really skilled negotiation. And, you know, when, when it was finally agreed, obviously it was a great moment. We reached the end of an Irish presidency that will live in our memories as a great presidency. His standing was huge. They wanted him to be president of the commission. I mean, that job was on the table for him at the end of that negotiation. He didn't want to take it. During the EU presidency, Ireland's Taoiseach showed he could hold his own with world leaders. The constitution would, however, be rejected in a French referendum. And even as Bertie Ahern was striking the deal, the news at home was bleak. So if you Tishuk, you look a bit upset this morning, clearly. You, no. you look as if you're a bit, bit shook. After well, I've, what lost, I've lost over 20% of the council seats. Listen, we, we got hammered in the local elections in 2004, and the people spoke, and they, they didn't like some of the policies that we were to, to, to get. It was the worst performance at local level since the 1920s. I, I, mean, I, I, I just said, Charlie, we lost the election. Policies that are being implemented by the government are too much uh, in line with right-wing policies, with the Progressive Democrats, and I think that that has to be changed. Ah, oh, to be whinging and giving up, but your backbencher's life is to whinge. Well, I think, I think it was very clear that there were three people in the government, him, Mary Harney, and Charlie McCreevy, and that in some sense, one of those three people had to be changed. How serious was it for, for Bertie's leadership? I think it was serious enough. Now, Mary Harney wasn't going to change because she led a separate party in government. I think Bertie Arne made sure it wasn't him that was changing. And in the end, the decision was made. Charlie McCreevy moved to Brussels. I think Charlie McCreevy was being blamed. Uh, Char Charlie McCreevy, like myself, is a pragmatic person. He knew we had to make some change. In July, uh, most other countries had nominated their commissioners, and he said, do you want this job or not? And I said, let me think about it. Now, he did kind of half change his mind once or twice. I thought about it for a week, and I said yes. Uh, the teacher and I have developed a close personal relationship over a long period of time. I'd say I know 25% of Bertie Ahern, but that's about 24% that anybody else knows, I'd say. Bertie Ahern moved quickly to quell unrest following the stunning local election defeat. TDs were summoned to an away day in Cork to hear the new message of social concern. Bertie learned the lesson. That was the message he got from the TDs. We had a, a, a thinking in Inchidani. He announced that he was of the left-wing uh, persuasion within Fianna Fáil the people in society that need help, the old, the disabled, uh, people who are marginalised. We like to target those resources in a meaningful way, an efficient way to help those people. I mean, I think you could overstate all of that and Inchidani and change the direction. I don't think it was a change of direction, to be honest. I think our party had uh, a very strong social conscience. I, I like to see a country of equality. I am a true um, Republican. I'm a true socialist. I believe in, in sharing. I believe in caring. Well, you see, only Bertie Hearn could get away with, on the one hand, saying that he's a socialist, and on the other hand, serving for 10 years in a centre-right government. I don't know what Bertie's interpretation of socialism is. I think it just means I'm a nice guy. Socialism is about putting people before politics. Uh, I was elected on that mandate. I believe in that mandate. In everything I did in politics, I, th I think I worked to prove that. Asking the Taoiseach a question is like trying to play a handball against a haystack. You hear a dull thud and the ball never comes back to you. Bertie Hearn deliberately hides behind an exaggerated inarticulacy in order not to give clear-cut answers to anything really. 
No, I'll, an I'll answer all the questions. Um, as best I can. He makes a virtue out of it. No, well, well, you see, because I would talk to some of my double knees, and I suppose those people don't understand that, um, that we're, we're, they're not well educated. If I said so, uh, I wasn't correct, so I, 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 I can't recall if I, I, if I did say, but if I, I did not say, or if I did say it, I, sh I, it, I didn't mean to say it. Um, you're asked, somebody says, I'll ask you a straight question, right? And, and then they'll ask you a straight question. But the straight question isn't straight at all. So the first thing you do is you pick up the bit of that question that isn't straight. I, I, I try and give you the... And then you give them ten minutes of that. And um, by the time you get back to the straight bit, they're all have gone for their break. His strength came from his public image and the support that he got from people. He knew that was an enormous addition to the party. I figure by now Bertie has met everyone in Ireland. Not once, not twice, maybe three times. I mean, he uh, entirely changed the way the office of Taoiseach is seen. There was no book launched or pub opened uh, that he was not personally there. He would shake hand after hand after hand, but he didn't spend more than about two or three seconds with anybody. And he's a busy man, you know, he won't sit and have long conversations about things. As Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern clocked up thousands of miles on the road. But for his last four years in office, he would do so alone. When you no longer had Celia with you, was it more difficult being Taoiseach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think these, um, these, these issues are, are tougher. Celia devoted the best years of her life to Bertie O'Hearn. She worked for him. She made sure he got on politically and successful politically. Uh, she was there as his partner as he himself described her, his lifelong partner. I mean, I greatly appreciated um, my relationship, my partnership, and, 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 and the fact that Celia was with me in those years. And I believe Celia would like if the relationship had been regularised. Celia left Bertie because she, it came to the point where she could take no more. The atmosphere was very strange. It was very uncomfortable. Um, personally, we felt it just wasn't right that this is what he had to do. Well, I, I knew that that interview was coming up, but I, I didn't watch it. I didn't want to, to um, go back on past um, occurrences, and I didn't want it to be discussed publicly. Okay. <coughs> and all phones are off, is that okay? Yeah. The trouble was that um, in the separation, I agreed I had to provide uh, 20,000 for my children to an education account. It was part of the agreement that, that I made. I um, don't like having to give these details to my children, but uh, for completeness. Um, and I did that. Uh, and I also um, had to pay off other bills. Um, so the money I'd saved was gone. Did you understand that why he had to do it? Uh, that's his question. No, that's, I'll leave that one. We were watching it, um, which was, of course, very emotional as a family member. So my friends knew that. Uh, I'd no house, house was gone, so they decided to try and help me. To see the emotion come out that you rarely see in Dad was just quite amazing. He was defending his honour, defending his, his whole life that he'd thrown himself into. You know, it's just, it's hard to see anybody being put in such an intrusive position. September 2006, Bertie Ahern reveals for the first time that he had taken cash from his friends. They were, they were, were friends of mine and they were Joe Burke, um, Dermot Crew, Barry English. I knew that he was going to give the names and with Ryan Dobbs in an interview. The money w was, was raised uh, by close friends. And just to watch the, the texts coming in one after another and the phone ringing one after another. So. The 6-1 interview was a high-risk attempt to deal with the news that the tribunal now had the Taoiseach in its sights. Uh, yes, uh, over uh, the last number of years, a number of false allegations, uh, half-truths, lies were made against me uh, to both of the tribunals. It was terrible because, um, you know, it, 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 I knew it was untrue. I mean, the, the trouble for me is when this thing started, I knew it was untrue. I mean, I've, I've been dealing now eight and a half years uh, with this stuff. 
Bertie Ahern's problems stem from Tom Gilmartin, the developer who had first surfaced as a tribunal witness in the late 90s. Over the years, Gilmartin's allegations had widened. The tribunal chose to focus on those relating to his former business partner, Owen O'Callaghan. Tom Gilmartin's allegation is that Owen O'Callaghan gave him to understand that he, O'Callaghan, had given money to Bertie Ahern, £50,000 in, in around 1989, another £30,000 sometime in between 89 and 92. He, he made various allegations. He used to ring up and uh, give all these allegations which were recorded by the tribunal, and he made loads and loads of these. Uh, that I had bank accounts in the Netherlands, Antilles, uh, that I had fixed the de designation for Golden Island in Athlone. Uh, for uh, Owen O'Callaghan, and that I had 15 million in an offshore account. And, and they changed, but I wasn't mentioned till way down the line. I mean, I was trying to run the country. I usually did look at this stuff on Saturday, Friday and Saturday night, and you're trying to answer in letters and you're getting big submissions from your legal people and you're into the courts and all of that. I never did get anything, so I wasn't maybe taking these things as serious as I was. With Tom Martin, there's been attempts to paint him as something of a loon, as a bit flaky, as a man with a grudge, a man with a mission. The problem for Fianna Fáil has been that in relation to the Porrick Flynn evidence, for example, he was shown to be absolutely dead right. The stories he told about Liam Lawler as well turned out to be substantially true. We also know from evidence at the tribunal that Owen O'Callaghan was paying large round figure sums uh, to politicians, including Liam Lawler um, and indeed other councillors. Both Owen O'Callaghan and Bertie Ahern have strenuously denied all of Tom Gilmartin's allegations, and specifically that Ahern received any money from O'Callaghan. Uh, they now know what I had for my breakfast, my communion, my confirmation, my dinner, uh, what I put into Miriam's account and Celia's account and everyone's account, but there is no evidence. I never got a, a penny uh, from Mr Gilmartin or Mr O'Callaghan. I got nothing from them. I said to my son, I'm going to give this man a good shake hand. And I'm going to clap him on the shoulder. My son smiles. He says, don't break his shoulder, father. Bertie, once he begins something, he never leaves it there. Look at the handshake with Paisley. Who would have thought it possible? It just released, as it were, feelings that were held back for years by both parts of this island. In 2007, after nearly a decade of false dawns, Northern Ireland's past seemed to have settled on a future. I mean, a lot of these negotiations over 10 years, a lot of these were as difficult, sometimes more difficult, in a funny way, than the Good Friday Agreement. We were there with Mark McGuinness and Ian Paisley and everything came together. I think it was, a, it was quite an emotional moment for both of us because we realised that all that work had finally borne fruition. It wasn't a question of celebration, we were just relieved. I mean, the one thing I'm absolutely sure of is it would not have happened without his, his, his contribution, for sure. I believe Northern Ireland has come to a time of peace. In the Republic, the decade-long boom continued. Bertie Ahern seemed set for an election he had to call by June. In the background, though, there was always a relentless pressure. We had got the material based on his private interviews with the tribunal and those of others, including Michael Wall and, and Celia Larkin. So he was aware that the Mail was going to publish uh, on Sunday um, details, very embarrassing details, concerning his personal finances and his explanations to the tribunal about them. I got a phone call at 1am. We knew something was going to happen, but when, no one knew. This was extraordinary. <laughs> And I'm saying, someone said he's going to the park at six in the morning. I said, the name of God. Are you nervous? Why did you do it like this? Jesus, are you nervous? I knew uh, that certain elements of the media were going to come at us. We were going for a third term, and most of them didn't want to see me get a third term. We probably left it go a wee bit up to the wire, so then Sunday morning uh, early was the time. As soon as they blamed me for getting them out of bed in, in, in the morning, we knew we were in for a rough time. Oh, I just sat here and we got problems now. The first two weeks were very difficult. We were in the back foot. I, I think that the mood, who the hell was shocking? I think it was wittily described as Meltdown Manor. 
He left the party headquarters and devoted himself to canvassing in the constituency, although he was the party leader. He was grumpy. There was one extraordinary press conference in the street where questions were brought up about his finances, and he literally stayed silent. Next question, please. He receives £30,000 in sterling in cash from Hall Wall in your office at St. Luke's. Why didn't you tell us last September about this? Vincent, I, I, I'll deal with all those issues, but that money was not money for me. No matter where he went, no matter what he wanted to talk about in relation to the election campaign, it still came back to this whole question of the money. Vincent! That, 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 Vincent! That, it, it, it is incredible. That was not my money. That was not my money. You know, there was the difficulty in the middle of the election with Michael Madol doing a press conference and all of that. But it's essential that the Taoiseach must make a comprehensive statement addressing all the new information now in the public domain. I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't know what, what he was at, but I mean, you know, that, that's, and I didn't watch him tomorrow, so I don't know what he said either. The Taunister was eventually persuaded not to jump ship mid-campaign. But now, senior members of his own party had questions for Bertie Ahern. Yeah, well, first of all, say about that, and I think it's important for me to say this, I was not summoned anywhere uh, by Brian Cowan. Remember that we were penciled in to do the press conference, just the three of us, on that Sunday. There were three senior ministers going to be present. One was Mion Martin, and the other, Gemma Ahern, and Brian Cowan. I think we said, well, can we talk to the Taoiseach about this as well? We felt that going out to St Luke's would have looked fairly dramatic and unnecessary, whereas the natural thing anyway was we all met in headquarters. I, I, was t I was going to talk to Brian, and then I said to the others, listen, come on in and we'll talk about this. And I did. In, in, in Bertie's limited style, he talked us through it, you know. As a matter of fact, when you're kind of less saying, yeah, OK. We said, look, we feel, you know, you're going to have to make a statement of this at some stage. He said, yeah. You know, we, we felt comfortable enough to go out and do other things then at the press conference in terms of, you know, why was it leaked, who was behind the leak of material. Fine Gael leader, I understand, I think was talking about the side of his mouth before the election campaign began. Fine Gael are saying things privately to people. But it was as though Cowan took over as leader of the party on that day and effectively remained so. It's all related to my judicial separation. That's how the Taoiseach this morning sought to finally end the speculation over his finances. And that was the turning point, you know, when he agreed to clarify it. Uh, we were then able to get into the campaign proper. While the media storm raged, public support for the Taoiseach seemed to grow. For Bertie Ahern, the election was back on track. But he then had things planned in the middle of the campaign, um, which fell right from the, the Westminster speech. Was a key, in my view, it was a key turning point as well. Peace in Ireland has been the work of a generation. And today as I salute all those who helped to lay the foundation for what is now taking shape. You move on to the debate with Andy Kenny, following hot on its heels. I now know that it is a matter of choice that you have decided that the top 3% should decided. gain the most. I now, have decided. I, I think that's one inequitable. One. He wins that debate. Well, it's almost decision time. I watched him in Westminster, and what I saw, actually, was quite a small, battered man from Drumcondra, like, like getting praise abroad and coming home to the most squalid and sordid and mean-minded campaign Owen. I've seen in my lifetime. Owen. And then suddenly we're into four or five days into the polling day with a, with a kind of momentum behind us. It's extraordinary. The party feeling that the tide is beginning to turn for them. And ultimately, I think in this election, the last election, they saw that, you know, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. The main question to be answered appears to be not will Fianna Foyle lead the next government, but with whom will they form that government? So far, they've held on to all of their seats. The PDs are in very big trouble. I love my country. I am deeply ambitious for it. As far as I'm concerned, my period in public life as a public representative is over. Once again, Bertie Ahern had outfought and outlived his critics. The remarkable campaign comeback, a testament to his enduring popularity. And so, by 89 votes to 76, Bertie Ahern was elected Taoiseach for a third term, the first since de Valera to win three successive election victories. Yes, but I mean, everything about Bertie Ahern is unprecedented. I mean, the man managed to get himself elected three times as Taoiseach in the modern era, which is highly unusual. And so it was a great pride, an acute sense of responsibility, that I accept the nomination of Dáil Éireann for the office of Taoiseach. 
Bertie Ahern has had to operate under the arc lights for a long time. But at the height of his success, Bertie Ahern revealed that his days in office were numbered. Are you going to run the full five years? Um, I, I, I intend to stay till 2012, Charlie, but you know, five, five years is a long time. Sometime during that five years, the party will have to choose a new leader, as Bertie Ahern has said he will retire before the next election. I think he was probably trying to be fair to people, saying that I'm not going to be here forever. But um, I, I think it was wrong that he shouldn't have done it. I think once, once you say you're not going to be around, the power begins to ooze away. People realise there's going to be another act. One, two, three, four, tell me that you love me more. He's a hugely, hugely experienced politician, from my point of view, and it's, it's obviously the party will ultimately decide, but my point of view, he, he is the obvious successor to me um, in five years' time or whenever. I don't think he was right in doing that either. And I gave a straight answer to a straight question asked by a straight journalist, Sean O'Rourke. I think that his decision to announce his intention to depart immediately put his government in a vulnerable position. But knowing what we know about the evidence at the tribunal, it may have been his judgment that it was prudent for him to indicate to the public that he would depart during the course of term of this government. For Bertie O'Hearn, the Mahan Tribunal must have been like Chinese water torture. It was drip, drip, drip. Morning, How are you feeling? Not a bother, me. He's under pressure to explain his purchase of £30,000 sterling, a donation for personal use from a businessman who is now about dead. acquiring £22,500. Unique opportunity to see the Taoiseach up close and personal, giving evidence about his private life in public. Some of the questioning was ludicrous, to be honest. Who was in his bedroom? Who could sleep in his bedroom? He left to a familiar chorus of cheers and boos. But I suppose when you sit there, it's slightly grubby in a certain way. It's, you're, you feel slightly uncomfortable that someone has to go through that, even if you ultimately think they should. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of commitment, Charlie, but you have to do it. But, it. but I have been dealing with it now for a long number of years. I think he is a very sensitive man, actually. Although he's very strong, Wales, and um, he's been very strong through his whole life in politics, I think he is a worrier and quite an emotional, sensitive person. Are you deaf as well as stupid? I mean, I've answered. He isn't a calm person. If you sit and you watch Bertie, he's a deeply, deeply wound up person. He's sitting and he has the chin down and the mouth goes in like a duck's ass, you know. Big out for Christmas. Help yourself. There was a lot of uh, confusion as far as the ordinary uh, person is concerned. You come back after lunch? Uh, no, no. So there's a lot of unexplained answers. You were asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At the start of 2008, the tribunal seemed to be getting nowhere, and the turning point when it came had nothing to do with the original allegations against Bertie Ahern. Celia Larkin has told the tribunal how she needed the original loan to buy the house where her two elderly aunts lived for over 60 years. What changed everything was that in 2008, the Irish Parliament discovered archival records in Drumcondra. And they went back to 1994. When the tribunal was following money trails, one of the trails led to this BT account. The tribunal is investigating the so-called BT account, which was used to advance a loan of £30,000 to Miss Larkin. I think the revelation that 30000 of the party's money had gone to Celia Larkin to buy a house and only been paid back, obviously, when the tribunal found out about it. I think that would, would damage him with party activists. Miss Larkin, have you anything to say about the, the tribunal revelations? People who would normally support Bertie felt... Uh, that this was inappropriate, that this was wrong. It did go on badly with the party from one end of the country to the other. Former Drumcondra branch manager Blair Hughes said he remembers Bertie Ahern's secretary making sterling lodgements. Bertie Ahern had already given his evidence that his lodgements to these accounts were his salary checks. He'd failed to mention the fact that he'd lodged uh, £15,000 sterling to his own accounts in 1994. So the thought that was on everybody's mind was, how is he going to explain this? Bertie Ahern would later explain that he had often changed Irish cash from his salary into sterling on trips to Manchester and that he had won some of it at the races. First of all, the bank evidence shows that they weren't all sterling. Um, and the ones that were sterling, uh, I've given the explanations of why they were sterling. And I explained in detail out of that 15,500 that about 1,500 of it was a bet. 
Later, Mr Hearn's former secretary, Grania Carruth, became tearful as she accepted she made the lodgements contrary to earlier evidence. The, the pressure of me having to do the doll, then to do European Council, and then to go to America, and before I'm back, she's in. She was very nervous. At times, she was tearful. I suppose it's fair to say that the tribunal piled the pressure on. Well, if it was put to her, she could end up in jail. She didn't change her evidence. She simply said that on the basis of the documentation, she accepted that she must have made sterling lodgements, but said she had no uh, memory of it. The way everything was seen by your average person in the street and your average member of the organisation, yeah, that was, that was bad. At one stage, she moaned, I just want to go home. Why they had to engage in such haste around that, to me, seemed unfair, and I'd say no more than that. I think that fatally damaged is public image. So now you're in a scenario where you have this tribunal going on, there's different revelations coming out, the media are sitting on every revelation. All people want to ask is about the Mahan Tribunal. I can appreciate that. That's what sells newspapers. What was your view on the revelation last week? What's your view on the revelation this week? Do you believe on his the accounts? Do you believe May. his stories so far? Uh, it's not a matter for me to believe or otherwise. It was becoming a significant distraction. I'm simply saying there was considerable public disquiet as a result of Bronya Carruth's evidence last week. Well, he says still that he didn't, that he didn't personally lodge Sterling. Like, oh, I mean, jeez. So, it's seriously. <laughs> oh, he got his secretary to do it. His secretary no, lodged Sterling. Yeah. Is... I don't think a single minister went to him and suggested that he should consider his position. He was able to work it out himself. Did Brian Cowan or anyone else put you under pressure to resign? Nobody put me under pressure. The only one that put me under any pressure was myself. We knew on the Sunday before, the whole family kind of gathered. He just um, very calmly and patiently, you know, calmly said, yeah, and I'm going to announce that I'm, that I'm stepping down. I guess we were still quite shocked to hear him say it. I discussed it with my daughters. I spoke to Celia, Celia Larkin, I spoke to Miriam. I, I felt he was right when he was telling me that that's what he was doing. Um, and probably a little bit relieved for him. I, I thought things were getting a little bit too uncomfortable. And I rang uh, a few people that were close to me. I got a call and uh, he uh, said certain things to me and I knew from what he said that he was going to announce his resignation. The, the night before, um, I, I, w I went for a, a drink with a few of my friends, a few of the guys who financially helped me and, and, and we, 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 we had our mind made up and we just went to another. When I woke up next morning uh, and uh, it seemed business as usual, you turn on the radio and it's all very normal. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock on Wednesday, the 2nd of April. Coming up as the dial returns, just what will the Taoiseach say about Sterling to keep his smaller partners and government satisfied? And I knew that the call I'd had the night before, that it wasn't going to be an ordinary day. Certainly I can say from myself, and I would safely say from around the cabinet table, there wasn't any sense of what was about to happen. But I could sense there was some tension in the room because ministers had been getting texts from their press officers to await a public statement by the Taoiseach at 10 o'clock. Suddenly I saw Mary Hennepin sort of put her hand on his shoulder and say, and I said, what's going on? And then people were looking at her, they were texting like hell. We were very surprised when he gathered together a few foolscap pages on which he had his own handwritten notes. We were, sh we were short of paper the week before that, Luke, so, so I, I, I was writing it on the back of, of sheets. <laughs> Suddenly he said, well, I'm going to America and I'm coming back on the 6th of May and I'm resigning. I think the initial reaction was one of shock. He clearly was upset himself. I have to say it was emotional, yes. I think you'd want to be made of stone. Uh, you'd have to have felt from that morning because it was sad. Huh? Yeah, it's slow. Huh? For most of us, since a shock, it was the end of an era. Mixture of surprise, um, sadness, and in another sense, that he was doing the right thing. In fact, the only sorry thing I had in, in hindsight that I got wrong, I should have called the press conference at six o'clock and got the media out of bed again. Thank you very much for your attendance at short notice. Uh, I've been privileged to serve my uh, community and my party and our country for many years in public life. In that period, I'm proud to have made a contribution to a, an unrivaled era of peace uh, prosperity and progress uh, on this island. It was my own speech. I want everyone to understand one truth above all else. Never in all the time I served in public life 
have I ever put my personal interests ahead of the public good? He certainly uh, disliked the fact that a tribunal had been able, in effect, to remove him from office. That is how he saw it. And following on from my return from the United States, it is my intention to tender my resignation to President McAleese on Tuesday, the 6th of May. And I do have to say that it's questionable whether a Taoiseach should be removed under those circumstances. Bertie Ahern today brought down the curtain on a remarkable political career. In April 2008, Bertie Ahern announced he would resign as Taoiseach after more than a decade in power. Take care. Thank you. Before he left, however, there was a final lap to run. After so many decades of conflict, I am so proud, Madam Speaker, to be the first Irish leader to inform the United States Congress Ireland is at peace. His big point was Ireland is at peace. That's some achievement, and nobody can ever take that away from him. That is why, with all our faults as human beings, we seek the honour of representing the people. Uh, I'll say because I've been through tribunals for 10 years, everybody knows what I've done. It's cost me a fortune, it's cost me everything I had. Um, I, I've been, you know, trampled all over the international press for, for one bad thing in all my political years. And um, it, it's, it's, it's just been horrendous start to, to finish, and I did absolutely nothing wrong. What I would say to you is, he's a simple person who's never lost sight of where he came from and where he's going. This is not a man who's amassed a fortune as Taoiseach or as leader of the opposition. And I am absolutely certain that my brother is not motivated by money. Bertie Ahern left office without evident personal wealth, but for a time at least, his finances were complex. It comes from circle, I can tell you that. I don't think it's right to take money if, you, if you're a minister to accept gifts from friends, even in entirely proper circumstances. I think it can give rise to difficulties. But I think, you know, in the judgment of history, whatever is established by the tribunal will be a very small account compared to his achievements. The man tribunal, it has to believe that banking records are wrong. It has to believe that it's a coincidence that Sterling just keeps on popping up. You know, there's just too much that is so bizarre. Well, I don't accept that Bertie Hearn as as much part of the old guard. There is absolutely no way Bertie Hearn would have achieved a third term if he had been materially the same calibre and character of person as Ray Burke and Mr Hyde. He has reunited the party and no leader managed to bring that party together as much as Bertie Hearn did. What did drive Bertie Hearn? He worked unceasingly for 30 years, but rarely spelled out his vision. He sees politics as a practical business of getting the day's work shifted and moving on to the next day. But on the other hand, you do look back at 10 years during which emigration is pretty well stopped, when there is continuing peace in Northern Ireland. And you can't really just throw it out the window and say, why didn't he make better speeches? His principal legacy, I think, is having squandered uh, a decade of growth uh, without giving us the strength to withstand um, many of the difficulties that we have today. But overall, the economy uh, has changed dramatically. He is associated with the boom times. The end of his tenure was the bust time. In office, Bertie Ahern made himself accessible to the Irish people as never before but he remained impenetrable to those around him. I think his greatest is that he keeps his counsel to himself. Very few people know what Bertie is thinking about. He's a solitary figure, yes. I think he has a lot of social friends and that, but I think, you know, when it comes down to it, it's, it's he himself within himself. I mean, I've been lucky. And like any politician, you, you get a few lows, but I mean, I've got a lot of high points that, you know, things that are, are good memories. I think that uh, his legacy will be good. And I don't think we're finished with him yet. I don't think he's going to step out of the limelight. I think he has his eye on the park. 
He's used to being in that sort of spotlight, and it's going to be very, very hard for him to leave it. Bertie O'Hearn has spent his adult life in the public gaze. A TD at 25, Taoiseach at 45. Still in his 50s, he resigned before he felt his time was up. The journey from Drumcondra to the pinnacle of national politics has been long and eventful. A journey that is perhaps not yet complete. I like to be able to make a contribution. And what I miss is not making a contribution. I mean, I, I enjoy politics. If there are other challenges, maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't intend to do nothing. What's good about politics is you feel you're doing something. And next Monday at 9.30, the award-winning Primetime Investigates returns with a new series, and the first programme exposes discrimination against the travelling community. Later, Brian Dobson meets Anthony Cronin on one-to-one -one at a quarter to twelve, but next it's questions and answers, and John Bowman has more on that in just a few moments. <laughs>